prima cosa che voglio dirvi è che sono The first thing I want to tell you is that I'm happy to see you. Quanto in questo momento rappresento and that anche la persona. This mo- in this moment I also represent ecco, the person of Jesus a little bit at a time. La maniera con cui stiamo assieme. Padre Gino Father Gino che questa volta wanted me to present myself a little less professional and to be, let's say, a little freer. So, the first thing, the first thing is this. Questa mattina, in questa scuola, a, new year, a new school year began this morning in this school, where for the first time this year, there were more than 1,000 students. Some are very young, and others are older. But everyone somehow knows that school is not just about giving you books or lessons, but that you have to study. So I don't want children and young people to know this, and then we forget it. Because it is not enough to listen to lectures, to have text. But you need at least some personal study. And the reference test, text staying with Christ will be just the way to go and review those parts that have most touched or questioned your intelligence and your heart. So the decisive words of this year's School of Christianity are these. Orientation of thought, of life, of relationships, of the movement. I explained to you once that the word movement, in addition to indicating organizations and even the church itself, means the movement of God's love in all directions towards us, through us, towards others, toward the world. But this movement has an orientation. These seem like phrases, but there is a beauty, an incredible richness in this, and perhaps also a possibility to change, to convert, to look, to see life in another way. Because The orientation, I repeat, is not from us to Christ, but from Christ to us. What is the difference? And I repeat it with the example of the mother and the child who goes towards his mother. He can fall, get distracted, delayed, get frightened by something that happens to him. The more the child may be hurt, the more he or she has fallen, the closer the mother goes to this child. To say that the orientation of our discourse is from Christ to us means this. That if in this room, in this moment, we think of Christ coming, it is because he continues to come. To this question, where is Jesus? I can answer with absolute certainty. Jesus is, the, is next to the person among us who is in the most difficulty at this moment. I don't want to explain what kind of difficulties. They could be intellectual, moral, family, health, sad experiences in the area of kinship. Do you understand? The person who is the most fallen at this moment among us Jesus is beside him, but not because he neglects the others, because with his divinity he becomes able to touch everyone and then afterwards say, 
this is the point for now. Look, see that this orientation can change a thousand things because you may find yourself in a family with the most unbearable person and if you ask yourself the question, where is this Jesus who comes towards us? The only person you cannot neglect is exactly the one who is in the most difficulty or the one who makes you work the hardest. Well, then the encounter with the person of Jesus who comes. And he decides how to come and where to dwell. To facilitate the discussion, since we are going to use this book, Staying with Christ, I think it is useful, and it has been pointed out to me, to at least reread the first pages of this book, the premises. Because I remember that when I wrote it, I was struck then, and I am struck now, by this expression from the Old Testament that presented the Messiah, who was to come as he who is desired, the desired one of all nations. It's a beautiful word. And I wrote in this book, this means that every human feeling feels something of Jesus. Every idea thinks something of Jesus. Every will wants something of Jesus. Every human energy reaches out to Jesus. Every human hope anticipates something of what will happen with Jesus. Every pain shares in the suffering of Jesus. Every joy is the prelude to the bliss of Jesus. Every death surrenders itself into the arms of Jesus. This is written in the first pages of the book precisely to indicate universality, which means universe, that is, all toward one. And then there was that beautiful expression that you always find in the book, Jesus is the inevitable human. Whenever, whatever analysis we make of the human, wherever in whatever situation, even the most distant, even the most lost, the only, the one that seems most neglected, Jesus is in the inevitable. In this orientation of Jesus coming towards us, however, at a certain point, the encounter happens. When the encounter happens, something must be said. We can know immediately what is being said to us. As soon as Jesus meets us, he says, Will you stay with me? The opposite of what he sadly asked the apostles, do you want to leave too? No, do you want to stay with me? And we answer him, stay with us, Lord. And here begins the work we have to do. Because it is not enough to talk about Jesus. It is not enough to have ideas about Jesus. And we cannot believe that this encounter with Jesus is an encounter with our ideas about him or our feelings about him. We need the flesh of Jesus. Where is the flesh of Jesus? The flesh of Jesus right now for you is me. For you it is the person next to you. That other person vice, and vice versa. Do you understand? For each other we are the incarnation of Jesus. This is the incredible thing that Jesus came to do on earth. Think of all of the sacraments. The Eucharist in the first place, which we have taken perhaps even today. His word that enters into us and shakes our minds and then after the other things, the whole church. But what is it for? It is for Jesus to be able to say, 
My incarnation continues in you, in you, in you, in the church that in fact is called body of Christ. When we speak of Jesus, when we speak of Jesus and of Jesus coming close to me, the point of maximum closeness is the other who is next to me, whoever he or she may be, even a beggar, even a disliked person, the neighbor. Let's give some examples. In these days, I found myself a little bit in this intellectual sadness because I heard that in some communities people asked questions. But why do you have to confess to a priest and you can't confess directly to Jesus or to God? Why? So out of curiosity, I went to look on the internet at this question. Well, the answers are not satisfactory when I looked. Because there's only one answer. Because in this particular delicate moment, Jesus wanted to touch us with the flesh of a person, a concrete person, and he chose priest, who looks at you, who speaks to you, who listens to you, who reproaches you if necessary, who asks you for changes, but a human person. That is why the sacrament of confession exists. And I'll tell you something. If I found myself at the end of my life and I felt the need to ask Jesus for forgiveness for everything and I didn't have a priest next to me, rather than stand in there saying, Jesus, Jesus, forgive me, I would say it to the person next to me. There is more incarnation. Because Jesus, through the ecclesiastical system, is incarnated in each of us. And that too, we talk about Jesus coming, and then we find that maybe the one who came is the person who you embrace with all the affection, with all the heart, with all the tenderness, or who makes you struggle a little bit, or who makes you suffer a little bit. But the flesh of Christ cannot be missing. The flesh of Christ is not my ideas about Jesus Christ. It is not my feelings about Jesus Christ. It is not books about Jesus Christ. But it is a concrete humanity that through the meditation of the church, through this body that is part of the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ, Remember a Carmelite saint, let's see if you know who she is, who prayed saying, Jesus, make me an extension of your incarnation. Who is she? Elizabeth of the Trinity. How many times in the past have I given you that example? If I say to you, love your neighbor, what do you do? You listen to what I say, and maybe you know that, and then another asks you, and then another, and another. You listen, and it is as if they tell you, do as I do. But if you understand that it is Jesus who is telling you, what is the difference? That in Jesus' mouth, the words, love your neighbor, means this. You give me your humanity to love this person. The saints understood that when they had to say, meet Christ, there was a greater extension for them ontological point of view, the human, 
But if the human was suffering, if the human was poor, if the human was marginalized, they were more certain that this human belonged to Christ. Remember that beautiful expression of Valdemar Kika from the liturgy of the neighbor. When you go to a poor person, a sick person, a needly person, it is Jesus who meets Christ. You go and you meet him and you meet Jesus and he sees you coming. He sees Jesus in you. You in him and he in you. The first question in the school of Christianity is Jesus asking, what do you want from me? It is he who must ask the question. And what can I answer to him? Many things. But the first inevitable thing, without which all other answers was being false, what do you want from me? The answer is, Jesus, I want to live. The word life. Life is the fundamental word in the relationship with Christ. Remember, I came to give life and to give it abundantly, abundantly richly. I am life. St. Peter, where do we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Pick up the psalm sometime to see how this word life is almost sung in the psalms in all forms. I will read you just three or four verses. In your hands is my life. I want to dwell in your house all the days of my life. Your love is worth more than life. In you is the source of life. The Psalms are a song. So life, John Paul II, Pope John Paul II reminded us while speaking to young people, life is the sum of all goods the original total good and all things that are necessary for these goods to make us live. All of this is called life. And note that life is the key word of the language of love and of mystical language when it reaches its fullness. In the text, then you will find many texts because the love language is very rich. When it says, you are myself, you are that part of me that can only be lacking in me alone. It is the letter of a man condemned to death who writes to his wife or the one from Benini's film. Do you know why I like light? I like light because it illuminates the face of the person I love. Or another one. I don't know, wh I don't know what is lo love is, but I know that since I met you, I have begun to live. And of these phrases, there is the literature of love on the theme of life precisely where the word that is more yours, more you see in the other, and for which you give your life for another. In the mystical language, Saint Teresa, Vida de me vida, vida de todas las vidas, le sostengo que me sustas. Life of my life, life of your life, support what you support it. Here the word life in myst mystical language and in love language is the fundamental word. So we are saying that if we want to have the original dialogue with Jesus, is this. 
What do you want? I want to live. I want life. And what would Jesus answer to this question? The gift of life is the first one I gave you. And it is the first vocation called to existence. And we must be happy with this gift. Be happy to live. Because our life is a gift in any circumstance, in any situation. Never undermine our perception of life as a gift. Of course, it is easier when the gift shines, when the gift fills our hearts. It is more difficult when the gift becomes problematic or when it is even sometimes filled with suffering. And yet the gift of life is the first thing. We must ask Jesus for the grace to be happy to live and to protect our happiness to live in all circumstances. This is the purpose of any true education. I am a gift from the beginning and I am happy to be a gift and I am happy to give of myself. Look, many of you are interested in educational issues. Do you understand? If one wants to go to the root and say, but what should I transmit above all? This. You are a gift. And you must be happy to live. And and those who love you must help you in this. Help people to feel happy to live. A very particular phenomenon is happening in the church. If you read the literature on holiness, there are more and more situations of young people. Let me mention Carlo Acuti, Sandra Sabatini, who are touched by suffering, sometimes even when they are very young, but with a very special grace. Jesus welcomed them by making himself present. Sometimes they feel the presence of the Eucharist. They feel the presence of Our Lady. And they are only able to give joy around their little bed. They are very young. They are all very young boys and girls who give tenderness, give joy, give faith. And this is becoming more and more frequent. And the text that you will even find a book marked by Signorelle precisely on this experience of young saints. When you say young saints, they are clearly saints who have had little to live on, many times due to situations of illness. But holiness has not been stopped by pain. It, is not, it has not been stopped by suffering. Of course there is, let's say, youth that shines with joy, but there is another joy. And in the church this phenomenon is becoming more and more frequent. Perhaps because Jesus wants to say something. Do you understand? Because a life that is short, that is even limited, and that is even overloaded with suffering, it is nevertheless unable to extinguish the joy of the eyes the joy of the heart, the tenderness. These are children who convert even the adults around them who cannot forget. The second problem is the second problem, every other vocation is second to the first 
vocation. You're a woman, you're a mom, you teach, you work, you're a priest. Whatever you are is always a second vocation. And vocations fail when the first vocation is neglected. Then vocations become problematic. They become sad. They are always analyzed according to circumstances. I expected this. Look how I am. You betrayed me. Others betrayed me. What am I living for? Do you understand? All vocations, whatever they may be, are livable only if the first vocation remains intact. Do you understand? When in the morning I am able to say, Lord, I thank you for the gift of life, for the fact that I am a gift. When you can say this, you will be able to live the other vocations. If you can't say this anymore, you don't feel like saying this anymore. You've been neglected on this. You haven't been helped on this. Then maybe you don't understand why, but why I can't be faithful to my vocation. And maybe think of that of a parent, think of that of a teacher. All vocations are second vocations, the third, the fourth, the fifth. And if the first vocation is not kept shiny, sweet, dear, tender, you know? Something that I sense just by opening my eyes and I still sense by closing my eyes at night. There were saints who said, I live each day so that I can live even more joyful on the day to come. Each vocation is grafted onto the first vocation. And the others get into difficulty if this root is neglected. In the end, I would ask you two questions. How do you integrate the tiring aspects of your existence into this truth? I will try to help you in this question. How to integrate the experiences you have had if you can communicate them to each other, if you can help. Make sure that the tiring aspects of your life do not affect the splendor, the purity of this originality. If I say, I live because God wanted me, he thought, thought of me from all eternity, he thought of me in his son Jesus, he thought of me by looking at Jesus in my face, and he made my heart like Jesus. Do you understand? When we think of certain saints, or when we also think of the Blessed Virgin, these things become much more evident because it is clear that they are experiences that have kept this original purity intact. There, how can we help you integrate the painful aspects of your existence into this truth? And then another second question is this. What would you say to a person who has been overcome by depression? People overcome by depression who are those who have come to say, what am I living for? What would you say to a person who suffers from this original depression? 
It's as if they are saying, they gave birth to me, but it was a mistake. And they are not referring to the parents, they are referring to him. What would you say? What therapies would you suggest? And at the end, we could t take up again that song that has become familiar. What do you think? You are my life, all I have not. We sing this often. This is our school of Christianity. I'll read you the fundamental points. Orientation. Christ incarnate. Who is the incarnation of Christ? The first question I ask Jesus, the answer Jesus gives me, the first vocation. I gave you life. You are a gift. You are mine. Your task, your work, is to give yourself to others. Here. I wish that this work is beautiful, that it reassures, and that when you are tired, the Lord helps you to think that there is no greater rest in the heart of God, which is to return to where you were born. And then our life, our days become a continuous thanksgiving. In these days in Brescia, we have had the death of Father Carlo. Tomorrow there is the funeral. Someone else spoke to me about other painful circumstances, other situations. But if we are to read what Jesus, God is telling us, it is the beauty of the gift he has given to us. Notice, and when we say eternal life, it means that we must hear Jesus say, I have given this life and no one will touch it. Whatever may happen, the life we have been given is eternal. Praised be Christ Jesus.